All right. Well, it looks like um, most everybody is in, um, but I imagine with this being um, the morning that we'll have a, a few more folks um, join us in the coming minutes. But um, in respect of everybody's time, we will go ahead and get started. Um, I see some familiar names and faces um, for those with cameras on, um, on our um, presentation today, but some new ones as well. So it's our pleasure to connect with you um, on behalf of Cell. Uh, my name is Tracy Butler. I am our Senior Coordinator of Post-Secondary Readiness and Success. And um, in a moment, you'll uh, meet and hear from Carrie Dank, our um, Executive Director as well. And we um, are so glad to have you with us and to share the findings of um, a report that we recently released um, in February of this year, um, titled Expanding Early Access to College and Careers. Um, recommendations for prioritizing and growing Indiana's pipeline of dual credit teachers through incentives and supports. And um, the length of that title is just an indicator of how much is in this report. And so um, today's uh, webinar presentation will be, uh, will provide just a brief time for us to share some highlights of the report, as well as um, hear from some of our K-12 and higher education partners who were involved with the research and also the production of the report. So um, a few housekeeping things. Um, we will, the chat is open for questions and comments. Um, it doesn't pop up automatically on my screen. Um, so there's a few points during the meeting um, or the presentation where I will be accessing um, that. But if you send me a note and I haven't seen it yet, if you can just give me a minute and hopefully I will get to it. Um, and then also today's um, presentation is being recorded and then will be shared afterwards, as well as um, a number of resources that are linked um, in slides at the end of the presentation. And as I, um, yep, as I open the chat, I see that Kylie, um, thank you Kylie, has linked the full report that really provides the foundation for today's um, presentation. So if you haven't had a chance to download it yet, I know that we sent it out in your meeting confirmation, um, but if you haven't had a chance to download it yet, we invite you to um, because um, the hour or so that we have today really um, will not provide you know, ample time to go into all of the details, but, um, but we have heard really positive feedback on the report and hopefully there'll be some valuable findings in there for you as well. So um, as we get started, once again, um, today's uh, presentation will really include two different pieces. Um, one is that we will go through the report and really highlight um, both the context for why, why we did the report, um, some of the key findings that came out of it, and then also um, the recommendations um, for K-12 partners um, that were generated from it um, that were really focused on kind of those localized K-12 initiatives and strategies that, um, that we would recommend, and more importantly, that, that K-12 partners would recommend as effective um, tools for building your pipeline of uh, dual credit teachers. And then after we um, focus on the report, and I'll be going through some of the highlights of it, then we'll transition to a panel conversation with, um, once again, two of our partners um, that were involved in the research and the creation of the report. And we'll really be hearing from them what does this look like in practice? Um, what are some of the, how are some of the recommendations already really shaping up to be effective practices um, in many of the schools around Indiana? And then what additional strategies might be helpful um, for you or for your local um, K-12 partners as they um, seek to expand dual credit and um, build their dual credit pipeline? So um, with that, we will go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to hand off to um, Carrie Dank, our Executive Director um, at CEL, which is the Center of Excellence and Leadership of Learning. And Carrie is going to share a little bit about um, why we did this report. Thank you, Tracy. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Tracy sort of framed up, our objective here was to uh, look at, out into the field and try to find information that was relevant to practitioners, whether you're in the higher ed space or the K-12 space, but um, uh, less about the uh, abstract research, more about you know, practical, tangible things that folks in the dual credit space can do to try to affect the, um, the, the workforce. And so uh, as a bit more context, it's the reason why we saw the, the opportunity with the Joyce Foundation 
Uh, as I think all of you know, Cell has been deeply immersed in the dual credit in the early college space for quite some time, and we've become strong advocates of the power that dual credit can provide students. And currently, about 60% of Indiana's high school graduates earn some type of dual credit, which is a, a pretty hefty share of students across the state. And as I'm sure all of you have seen, there are an increasing number of policies that have incentivized schools to offer expansion of dual credit offerings, particularly along the Indiana College Corps. Uh, the Commission has done, the Commission for Higher Education in Indiana has done a really nice job of, out, of laying out the, the reasons why schools might want to engage in this and the benefits to students and families. And so it isn't difficult to see that there'll be continued growth of dual credit throughout Indiana as the state continues to incentivize that. And Tracy, you can, yeah, thank you. And so uh, while all of those things were, were great, at the same time, schools are facing the significant labor shortage uh, that is felt not just in urban areas, but rural areas, uh, suburban areas. Teachers are in just, just short dem or high demand right now, short supply. And so that is occurring at the same time the Higher Learning Commission has demanded higher qualifications for dual credit teachers, and that takes effect in 2023. Uh, and what will likely happen is it'll push many qualified teachers out of the market where they're no longer eligible to teach dual credit unless they become uh, credentialed through taking additional uh, coursework through a university, and if they haven't already, earning a master's degree. At the same time, many districts don't have compensation agreements that are aligned with dual credit uh, qualifications. There isn't necessarily a fiscal incentive associated with the teacher getting a master's degree or certainly taking the 18 hours of, of graduate credit to become qualified to deliver dual credit. And so what you see across the state are principals or superintendents and in some cases school boards that have figured out that this is something that they need to address and they have in isolation tried to put some incentives in place. And so uh, as Cell worked with some of these schools, we realized that these oftentimes were the outliers in that across the state, there was no uniformity in how schools were trying to uh, address the problem. In fact, in many cases, schools didn't have a plan in place to try to incentivize teachers to uh, become credentialed to continue to teach dual credit. It was sort of relying upon the good naturedness of the teachers in hopes that they would see the benefit for students and uh, engage in this on their own. So we thought the, uh, the space was ripe for this idea of we should uh, look out across the K-12 landscape and try to understand the range of things that schools are doing to incentivize teachers and then try to draw attention to those practices or policies that seem to be promising and seem to be helping to create a supply of dual credit teachers and share that broadly across the K-12 space so that we uh, help to inform the field in a way that maybe some folks are unaware. So that's, that's our hope. This should be a very practical, uh, useful tool and I encourage you to ask many questions so that it's, it's relevant to your work. Great, thank you so much, Carrie. And um, and just one thing I will add as well, you know, as we were conducting this research, which really took just a little over um, six or seven months or so. One of the resounding themes we heard from many of our school partners, whether it be through surveys or through focus groups or our working groups, um, which we'll talk more about in just a minute, is that um, while there are some consistent themes across, um, across K-12 districts in our state regarding some of these um, very challenges that Carrie has spoken about, that, that really um, the situation is so unique to each, um, to each school district. And then even for the individual dual credit teacher, it's, it's very unique as well. So, um, so the research was really focused on um, identifying some of those themes and really helping inform the field that was wondering not only how can we develop you know, effective strategies within our own district to build the pipeline, but uh, there was also great curiosity around and what's happening around the state, um, as well as even just some of my neighboring districts. So, um, so our goal was to really inform the field with more information um, related to what was going on in the state. Now let me see, if, yep. 
So, um, so as we um, as we begin, we wanted to share what a few of the major research findings were um, from the report. The report itself is close to 30 pages or so. So as I said earlier, this really is just a highlight of some of the key takeaways. And uh, before we dive in, just wanted to share really what the overall research design was. Um, so you know where this data and research came from. Um, so the goal for the report was really to produce actionable research that was from the field of K-12 partners and higher ed partners and for the field of K-12 higher ed um, and higher ed partners. And so how we achieved that was um, to have really a multi-pronged approach where we collected both quantitative and qualitative data. Um, quantitative data included um, surveys that were sent out late last spring um, to both um, public and private schools in Indiana. We had um, close to 131, actually a little over 131 respond. Um, and unique schools respond to that survey. And that survey really gave just somewhat of a land landscape um, understanding of what is going on in, um, um, across Indiana schools for the, those that responded regarding the delivery, both the delivery of dual credit, um, including academic dual credit, um, as well as what practices are in place and policies are in place to incentivize and support um, dual credit teachers. Um, from there, we, um, we pulled some key findings from there, and then we transitioned to our qualitative data um, collection, which is really my favorite part, um, because that's where the, the, the stories and kind of the nuance and also the effective practices really start to, to come to the surface. So we conducted um, focus groups, both, both with dual credit teachers and then with K-12 administrators, um, who really identified some of the key barriers that their um, districts face and also their individual teachers face in engaging with dual credit and building that pipeline. Um, but then also from there, took some of those findings um, from the focus groups and then transitioned to working groups. Um, with a practitioner work group that was statewide and included a um, cross-section of both K-12 administrators, certainly teachers, as well as our higher education partners. And then, um, and then we also worked with a state leader work group um, that included representatives from the um, Indiana Commission for Higher Education, um, Indiana Department of Education, and um, a number of other um, partners as well, and then certainly some of our higher ed partners to ensure that recommendations coming from this report, while they were very focused and are very focused at that local level of K-12 and then the partner, the local partnerships between K-12 and higher ed, that there is alignment between these recommendations as well as the, um, you know, some of the, the state level priorities and policy reform that's underway um, that's related to this. Um, and I will apologize, my numbering <laughs> on two slides now as I downloaded, um, the, the numbering that looked fine yesterday is not is not looking good today. So um, I just have to say my apologies for that. Um, all right, so let's dive in. So um, focusing on that survey, once again, um, this, give, this slide gives you just a little bit of information about um, who we heard from on that survey. And um, so as you see some of the, the next few slides and you're wondering which of the schools really are, um, are represented in that sample, um, these, these are the schools um, that we heard from. And um, once again, um, these slides will be in the presentation will be available to you after today. And so if there are details that you're not able to, um, to take note of, or if you don't wanna take notes, um, just know that all of these will be available to you. Um, what we saw here and what we were pleased to see in this sampling um, with some of the disaggregation of these subgroups is that we really did have a nicely representative sample of Indiana schools. You know, part of, um, part of the goal of doing this kind of disaggregation is to ensure that we are not just hearing from one unique group that's significantly going to skew what the findings were. And, um, and from this sample, um, both we and our research partner um, of Education Northwest we're pleased to see that it was um, that it was largely a representative sample. Um, I did forget to mention earlier that our education, our research partner on this project was Education Northwest, and so um, Cell worked closely with them um, throughout the process. Um, both on the quantitative and qualitative data collection, and then also the um, creation of the report. And all of this was made possible um, with the generous support of the Joyce Foundation. 
All right, so as we um, dive into, first, these are the findings of that survey, and we'll move into the qualitative findings in just a minute. But um, overall, you know, one of the questions on the survey was um, what different levels of um, incentives are schools offering and how do those vary by the stage of the pipeline that, they, that a school is trying to build? So for example, as it relates to this slide, if a school is focused on engaging teachers in dual credit, so here that would mean um, supporting and encouraging and incentivizing teachers to take courses towards becoming credentialed to teach dual credit, we saw that 19% um, of our schools in the survey um, were providing some level of incentives to teachers to become credentialed to teach dual credit. Um, and, then, um, and then we see that number jump significantly um, when you move down the pipeline and you're thinking of that point at which um, teachers have become, have, they've earned that credential, then 49% of the schools are providing some level of financial incentives for that earning of the credential. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more in a minute about what, that, what kind of incentives we're seeing um, offered at that stage. And then ultimately, when it comes to activating those teachers, which really means to have them teaching um, dual credit, um, again, 49% of our schools um, who responded to this survey are providing some amount of financial incentives to school, to teachers who are then delivering dual credit courses in their school. Okay. Um, and so here we were um, drilling down a little bit to disaggregate what are the specific kinds of incentives that um, are and the most common incentives that are offered for each stage. So um, beginning over with the left side here, and I won't read every slide and every detail of every slide, but did want to highlight a few things. Um, at that engage stage, when we, um, when schools are working to really kind of recruit and engage teachers in taking classes to become dual credit credentialed, um, we see that um, that the most common um, financial incentive here is tuition assistance with 11% of the schools offering, um, or I'm sorry, 11 schools offering um, tuition assistance. Um, a note on that, you know, this was um, not a surprising finding, but it certainly stood out to us, both at Cell and a number of our partners that were involved in the planning, um, that schools are continuing to, um, to support directly the tuition for teachers as they um, enroll in classes to earn their credential. Um, a side note here, um, there are a number of programs in the state, um, including through CEL. Um, we have STEM Teach Indiana and Teach Dual Credit Indiana that are, um, that are supported by the Indiana Commission for Higher Education. And, um, and so we would encourage schools that as you're thinking of your own strategies and, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but um, as you're thinking of your strategies to build your pipeline and also play the most strategic ways to invest your own direct dollars in incentives and supports, we would encourage schools um, not to be using their own direct um, budget and line items for paying for tuition and instead really leverage those third party programs like STEM Teach and um, Teach Dual Credit Indiana and really try to connect teachers with those so that you can really reallocate some of that funding um, towards some of these other financial incentives. Um, so on that note um, of other financial incentives, as we move down the pipeline and we look at um, the, com the incentives that schools are offering teachers once they become credentialed um, to teach dual credit, we see that um, when they become credentialed to teach dual credit, the most common incentive is a step on the salary scale. Um, and so we will see this, for example, um, included in the, um, the teacher contract, the, the master contract. Um, sometimes it's specifically um, aligned with and attached to the earning of the dual credit credential um, and or sometimes it is um, connected to um, earning that master's. Um, but a step on the salary scale to earn that credential is the one that we see um, most commonly. And then um, as we move down the pipeline to, um, to looking at the incentives that are offered to teachers to actually teach dual credit once they've earned that credential, here we see a flip where the um, most common incentive is to offer a stipend. So that stipend, um, you know, schools are structuring it differently. Um, the stipend might be structured in such a way that it is scaled depending on how many class, how many dual credit classes are being taught. And that's what we would recommend. So that the more 
classes that are being taught, um, dual credit classes, the, um, the higher that, that stipend is. Um, but we do also see that some schools are not able to scale it um, for a number of reasons. And so they are offering instead a flat stipend that does not, is not adjusted um, based on a number of dual credit um, classes that are taught. Okay. All righty, um, this was just one of those, um, you know, you, um, unique findings that just really kind of um, stood out to those on the research team. Um, you know, sometimes there's, there's known things that you're looking for in research questions, and then sometimes um, there's just some unique elements that really jump out to you. Um, this one for us, we wanted to highlight for you all, and we saw that schools that offer what we had defined as really being that, that middle range of um, dual credit courses, middle in terms of the um, kind of the overall sample set of offering 10 to 19 dual credit courses. Um, those, those schools were most likely to offer an incentive. So those that were schools that were offering the lowest amount of dual credit courses were not really leveraging incentives as much. And similarly, actually, schools that were offering the highest number of dual credit courses were also not leveraging incentives as much. So here, you know, we, we think and we've heard from our K-12 partners that the story that we're hearing back from this is that really incentives are particularly meaningful and valuable and being used by schools who are working pretty intentionally to build their dual credit offerings. So they've got enough underway um, and enough in place that they feel like there's a foundation of them and are, and are really working to build them. Um, and anecdotally, what we heard is that particularly as schools get closer to being able to offer the Indiana College Corps, that incentives um, are one of those levers that they are using in order to expand their number of dual credit courses. Okay, so this was um, just some follow-up research we did that really offers just a little bit more detail about the level of stipends that are being um, awarded. And so this, you know, it's as it says on the screen here, it's really important to remember here how small the sample size was for each of these groups, um, because as, as we just aggregate, you know, into smaller and smaller groups, um, we're no longer talking about the 131 schools that replied to this survey as much as the specific schools that, that offer this particular credential. So, um, so for example, um, on the left side of the screen here, looking at the schools who are offering a stipend to earn the credential, um, the average, we had six schools, um, provide what their range was for those stipends. And the average stipend for, or, um, for earning a credential is a little over $2,100, okay? And then, um, and then as we shift and we look at the level of stipends that are being offered by schools to teach dual credit, again, this, is, um, this was the data that we were able to collect. So for those that are structuring it by class, um, so it's scalable depending on the number of classes being taught. We had seven that have structured it that way with the average being a little over 800. And then, um, and then you can see you know, the other two categories that we have. And so um, while this data here that we collected was not a formal part of the research project, we, um, we did hear some requests from our school partners as we were releasing the report and in conversation saying, um, really asking for as much detail about that specific level of award as possible. Um, because what we know from um, our schools um, is that knowing, um, knowing both kind of what the kinds of incentives are, whether it's a step on the salary scale or a stipend is valuable, but it's also really meaningful to know what are the specific amounts that we're talking about. Um, and so one strategy that a school could take away from even looking at this data is to consider what, um, to think of the schools around you, um, particularly some of the school districts around you or some of your dual credit teachers might be um, might be getting approached to come teach at those schools. Um, it would be really helpful to know what are the incentive practices at our neighboring schools, and then even more than that, what level of stipends and steps on the salary scale are they offering? Uh, because we're already seeing, you know, that there's a great competition at the local and regional level, um, and really is different schools trying to attack, attract um, dual credit teachers. 
but we also know that, um, and I think we had one of our schools refer to it as a cliff. We also know that September 2023 is going to be a pretty significant date on the horizon, as Carrie shared with those new um, HLC requirements taking effect that um, many of our schools that we spoke with are anticipating even greater um, competition at that point um, to attract and retain dual credit teachers and possibly um, they're anticipating seeing some greater movement of dual credit teachers among some of the districts in the region. Um, certainly this won't happen at every school district and at every um, in every community. There's a number of things that attract and retain dual credit teachers um, beyond just the financial stipends, but we do know that the financial stipends are a pretty significant factor. Okay, so in our research, um, one of the questions we had as we shifted to our qualitative conversations and qualitative research is we asked schools, um, what are some of the key barriers that your teachers are facing um, to engaging with dual credit and teaching dual credit? And then, and with that, what are some of the main barriers that your school district is facing in building your pipeline? Um, because really, as, as we build up, you know, those barriers that a teacher is facing, you know, if, if you have that facing a number of teachers in your district, then that barrier also becomes a barrier for the district. So, um, so just to kind of quickly highlight some of these, um, one of the barriers was impact. You know, teachers not necessarily um, who weren't already involved with dual credit, teachers not realizing kind of the impact that either dual credit has on um, students as far as their, um, their increased likelihood of accessing, persisting, and completing post-secondary. And there's great data on that from the early, um, early college report from the Commission for Higher Education. Um, so teachers may not be aware of that, but even if they are, they may not be aware kind of of the unique impact they can have as a dual credit teacher. Um, so that we've heard from some schools that it's been really, for them, it's taken kind of one-on-one -on -one conversations with teachers to, to really um, engage them and convince them sometimes that they could really be effective and impactful as a dual credit teacher. Um, so time is one of the, the two main barriers we heard. It was time and cost were the main two main barriers that we um, heard from our teachers as well as our administrators. Um, just having the time, um, you know, to go back to school if you're if the time requirement is that you need to go back to school and to earn your credential, but also having additional time once you've earned that credential then to teach dual credit classes because um, they do require a unique level of time investment from the teachers um, and the schools who are teaching dual credit. And so um, time, I think that was another theme given, um, given that even before the pandemic, certainly the capacity of teachers has been stretched thin um, with the time they're able to put in um, for many, many years. And that was only exacerbated by the additional um, requirements and expectations um, of teachers as they responded to the needs of students during the pandemic, students and families. Um, cost was the second um, highest barrier both in terms of the direct cost of going back to school um, and earning the credential, but also in terms of the, um, the opportunity cost of choosing to engage with, with dual credit instead of really either other um, income earning opportunities within the school, whether it be coaching or, or stipends associated with other extracurricular roles that a teacher may have, or working um, outside of the school district at, in, a, in a job or an opportunity that pays a higher rate than um, a dual credit credential would. Um, and then I'll just go through the others a little bit more quickly. Um, for process, we heard that for some, the process to either become credentialed to teach or to teach dual credit can feel pretty cumbersome um, and is a daunting process and an overwhelming process for some. And then lastly, the connection. Um, and this I would say was one of our more surprising findings is that our dual credit teachers were really um, providing feedback that sometimes it feels like they're on an island by themselves, um, teaching dual credit and specifically in their subject area. So where there might be more of a community and sometimes a structured PLC, sometimes not a structured PLC, but where other teachers within a school or a district might have a more formal way to connect. Sometimes it's the dual credit teachers who feel like their work is so unique and the requirements that they're operating under are so unique that they don't really have a peer or a community to connect with that can relate as well, um, either locally or even sometimes statewide. 
All right. So we, um, okay, so just a quick time check. So as we, um, as we transitioned to talking about what some of the recommendations were, um, we wanted to um, just take a minute to hear from you all um, by entering into the chat. What are some of the most significant barriers your um, district um, if you're a school partner, your own district, or just your local district, if you're not a school partner, um, what are some of the most significant barriers they're facing um, as um, they're working to build their pipeline of dual credit teachers? So we'll take a minute as some of you all um, just respond in the chat if you'd like to. And then, um, okay, great. So teacher shortages in general, yeah. Finding teachers, so again, teacher shortage, and then once you find them, being able to pay them enough to take on teaching and dual credit or teaching dual credit. Okay, great. Well, um, well, feel free. Um, thank you for all of you who have already started to provide feedback. Um, feel free to keep providing feedback. I'll continue to move through our presentation so that we have ample time for our conversation with our partners. And then, um, but I can see that there's been a lot of comments and conversation happening in the chat among our attendees. So please um, keep that going. Um, I always, as an attendee, like to just engage with the chat and engage in conversation sometimes. So please feel free to keep um, participating in the chat and we will move on. Okay, so our recommendations, as I've alluded to um, earlier, what we, as we've been talking about this pipeline of dual credit teachers, one of the first things that um, the working groups did was really to develop and de define what do we mean by a pipeline. So this is the, as simple as it is, this is the um, the structure that and the framework that we came up with in the research that when we think of a developing a pipeline of dual credit teachers, there's really four unique stages that you can um, imagine being within this pipeline. And then ideally, as a school district um, in partnership with their higher ed partner or or even other partners in the community, as you're as you're really strategizing how do we build this pipeline, you can begin by thinking and assessing, okay, where are we already? You know, are we strong? with recruitment and credentialing, but as far as actually getting teachers to teach or even retaining teachers, that's where we need to be focusing more of our energies. Or is it the opposite, that you have um, you know, pretty ample supply of teachers currently teaching dual credit, and by every indication, they're going to be staying with the district for quite some time. There's no early retirements. There's no kind of sense that people are moving, but it's really the recruitment and credentialing that, that you are needing to focus on. Um, you know, we would encourage schools, again, just to, to strategically kind of think of what their pipeline is and areas of needed growth um, and areas really where it's not so much about growth, but it's sustainability. All right, so these are the recommendations. I am not going to go through all of them um, as much as particularly because we know everybody can read um, the slide and hopefully you'll have the time to read the, um, the recommendations portion of the report as well. Um, but we did just wanna just show you at a glance what the 11 kind of core recommendations were um, that came out of the research. And so, um, so the process to identify these again was were those um, focus groups and the working groups that we worked with. So these recommendations are coming primarily from K-12 partners and then their higher ed partners as well. They represent both some of the effective practices already in place um, in pockets around the state of Indiana, as well as some new areas of strategies that our um, partners said, you know, if we could, if schools could be intentional and strategic and proactive about building out some of these strategies, it would be helpful in building your pipeline of dual credit teachers. So um, there's a, the color coding here, I'll explain. Um, those that are just in black font are really um, related to more of those structural pieces um, and systems piece local but systems level pieces that are overarching um, considerations and strategies for building your pipeline um, including um, that the first um, step critical step is for a district to pri prioritize offering dual credit um, this was our last recommendation that we added on it was initially a very neat set of 10 and then as we did kind of that final read through with our partners it became clear you know from our partners input that the big thing that was missing was first a district needs to prioritize offering dual credit because if that priority is not in place um, 
then all of the other strategies and recommendations will be much more difficult to implement. Um, with that priority on dual credit, um, you know, I, I think it goes without saying, but it's really important to say, um, I speak on behalf of all of the K-12 partners that were involved in the research, you know, a priority on dual credit does not mean only a priority on dual credit. There are so many other curricular um, priorities that school districts must weigh, um, and also not just at the high school level, but looking at K-12. So saying here that a priority on dual credit is important is not to, um, to really talk about dual credit in isolation. We know that it needs to fit into a much broader scope of other priorities within a district. Um, but the point here is that dual credit does need to be included in those priorities. Um, as we move down the list of recommendations, those here that are in red relate to the financial incentives. So, um, so the key one is to anchor, um, anchor the strategy to build the dual credit pipeline in some sort of financial incentives. While there are many things that a district can do, um, and here it's seven through 11 of our recommendations that are non-financial and don't re require funding, um, but if a district is only providing those non-financial supports without a financial incentive, it's be gonna become increasingly difficult to attract um, and retain those, um, those dual credit teachers. Um, and then lastly, the seven recommendations here that are in green, as I said, are those that are non, what we've been calling non-financial supports. And those are ways that um, districts can be really intentional about making sure that your dual credit teachers, your current ones or your emerging ones are feeling seen and valued. And also that you're kind of pulling different levers you have as a district um, and as a high school particularly, to, um, to help address some of those barriers that we talked about earlier. So a key one here is um, number nine, is one that we heard a lot about, is that um, while we can't make more than 24 hours in a day, some districts have been pretty creative about offering some flexible scheduling with their master schedule for their dual credit teachers to make sure that they, um, that they have a little bit more time in their day, um, either to prepare for finals if they're, taking classes to become credentialed, or if it's additional time either to meet with students um, or to do PD or to, um, to grade assignments if you're already teaching dual credit. Okay, so I know I'm going quickly here, but just wanna make sure that we can, um, that we have our time for our conversation with, um, with our partners. So this is just a slide that, um, that really goes back to what those barriers were that we talked about earlier and really starts to align some of the effective practices that I've just really gone through as recommendations um, with each of those barriers. So, um, so most of these we've already talked about um, and I think we'll also come out in our conversation with, um, with Josh and Lakeisha in just a minute. So right now, I'm going to go ahead and hold questions um, because I know we'll have questions for our partners as well. And, um, and I'm going to invite Lakeisha and Josh um, to take themselves off to turn their cameras on um, and also to take themselves um, off of mute. Great. All right. So, um, so as, I, um, as I hand off to Josh and Lakeisha, or I'm not handing off, I guess we're having a a conversation. Um, first, I wanted to introduce both of them as um, key partners in this process and in this research. Some on the call um, might already be familiar with them. Um, and if you are not, I encourage you to reach out to them. They've been really significant um, thought leaders and representatives of the practitioner space in this process. So Josh Blossom is a principal with Wabash High School, and um, Lakeisha Hillard is the director of K-14 initiatives with um, Ivy Tech Community College. So um, Josh and Josh and Lakeisha, I should say, both served on our practitioner work group um, for, um, that was the key group that developed the, the recommendations and reviewed the research. So um, Josh and Lakeisha, welcome. Um, and so my first question for you all is, um, can you please um, introduce yourselves um, more than I've done and share really what your um, role is related to dual credit and the credentialing of dual credit teachers? I'll start. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Tracy stated, I'm Lakeisha Hillard. Um, and I just want to know, Tracy, where did you find this picture? 
Um, I, I actually took it off of your ago, LinkedIn. So I feel like I'm deceiving the audience. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I took it off of your LinkedIn profile. <laughs> no worries. Um, thanks, for, thanks for that. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Lakeisha Hillard. I am the director of K-14 Initiatives for Ivy Tech, Valparaiso, Michigan City, LaPorte service area. Um, my role, I've been with Ivy Tech about a year and a couple months now. However, I've been doing this work with early college and dual credit programming for over 10 years now, where I used to work with City Colleges of Chicago. So while I'm new to the Indiana area with this initiative, I'm not new to this work or this process. Um, I just wanted to uh, highlight that. Um, as it pertains to the credentialing process with dual credit teachers, part of my role is kind of the touch point, one of the, the frontline contacts for our dual credit high school partners to uh, receive the high school teachers' credentials and pass them along after reviewing them with, with our partners, going over their course uh, confirmations to see if, if the course they wanna teach, first of all, is even able to be offered this year or the school year that we're in um, because it has to go up against our crosswalk. So a part of that is being the frontline person to say, okay, you can offer this course. And then I meet with our internal stakeholders at the campus, our program chairs um, and or department chairs to talk about the courses that the school would like to offer. So that's part of my role with, as it pertains to dual credit credentialing of instructors. And then uh, um, I'm Josh Blossom, principal at uh, Wabash High School uh, in Wabash, Indiana. We're in the, the, the Northeast um, region. Um, so I guess my, my role is pretty tra traditional in that, um, you know, I'm charged with uh, recruiting uh, teachers with master's degrees um, that align with the pathways that we offer at um, Wabash High School. Um, and then also identifying teachers uh, within our um, school corporation um, to recruit recruit to take dual credit, to take master's levels uh, classes, um, to be able to, uh, to teach in those pathways as well. So uh, it gets creative with, um, in that endeavor, uh, finding ways to, to, um, to meet the needs of our school corporation and our students um, as that's directly aligned to our, our workforce um, priorities within this region. Great, thank you both. And so um, building on your introductions, can you share a little bit about what your um, context is and what your experience is currently with the credentialing of dual credit teachers? Um, Carrie shared earlier what the statewide context was for the report, but can you um, uh, help us understand really what that means for your own um, experience and practice right now? Uh, well, uh, for us, um, uh, the report uh, really illuminates um, it, with respect to identifying the, the barriers and the difficulties that we have in, in being able to, to maintain, um, it really articulates uh, those very, very well. So um, we find it uh, increasingly difficult to recruit teachers, um, let alone teachers with, with master's degrees. Um, uh, but I, I think what we've done very, very well in Wabash City Schools is making uh, dual credit a priority. Um, so when it comes to hiring teachers, we are, we are, we are um, looking to hire teachers with, with master's degrees and we do pay them uh, considerably uh, more to teach those classes, uh, not only um, within um, the regular pay scale, uh, but then uh, offering those financial incentives in the form of stipends per class per semester um, taught here as well. So. Uh, it, it really is a priority and it's our goal to have dual credit um, opportunities for, for students in every one of our uh, graduation pathways. Um, and in doing, uh, in doing so, I think that priority it has made it such that it's an easier conversation with our school board and with our community about what it is that we're spending. So, Well, similar to Josh, um, I find that the report does articulate well the happenings of the dual credit operation and what's um, about to come through um, the pipeline as far as with the HLC credentialing of teachers. In the past two years, I'll say on the onset of COVID, a lot of instructors throughout the state of Indiana were uh, provided the liberty of being credentialed on a modified model. And that will be coming to term um, in the next 12 months at the start of the 23 uh, school year. So September 1st, 2023, no longer will dual credit instructors be able to teach um, the way they've been teaching in the past two years. And so that has caused um, a lot of disruption, I will say, amongst our partners throughout the state, not just for my service area, but 
all over as it pertains to being able to teach those courses. And what Ivy Tech has found is that about 10 of our priority one liberal arts and sciences courses will be impacted significantly, significantly by that. So that means like our biology, um, math, 136, 137, bio 101, Spanish 101, 102, English 111, 206. We're going to be losing a lot of credentialed on a modified basis, if you will, teachers. And so we're trying to jump up in front of that by rolling out an online model where fully credentialed teachers, meaning those that hold a master's degree and or 18 hours, um, and I'm sorry, 18 hours in the content or discipline area, We'll be able to have you know different shared models. I know we're going to get into that later, but um, we project and foresee that we're going to lose a lot of instructors throughout our um, high school partners throughout the state. So we're trying to get ahead of that as far as credentialing uh, on the modified model and, and helping the schools and school districts and corporations um, also get ahead of that by offering you know the STEM teach that you mentioned earlier, um, mm -hmm. uh, teach Indiana, so that we won't lose as many you know, that we project in those liberal arts and science areas and or the humanities, if you will, as well. You know, and I'll, I'll um, add, add to that as well. That's, you know, one of our, our main concerns is that alternative credentialing for us has, um, even though 2023 has been looming for a while, it does um, it does constitute an important important bridge um, that has been able to get us there and uh, we're no longer gonna have that. So, so while um, as a school, uh, we're looking, um, very good when it comes to uh, that that deadline, uh, and we'll meet that deadline. And we're projected not to lose those opportunities um, in education. Uh, people uh, and they can be very transient. I mean, we can have teachers that have those master's degrees that get recruited to teach somewhere else, and, and we no longer have a bridge to get us um, to that next instructor unless we pull that instructor from somebody else. So that's, that's a legitimate concern. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, so, so building off of those concerns and the experiences that you each are having, I think, um, I think if we can go first to you, Josh, um, what are some of the recommendations or the effective practices that you've seen um, to make the biggest difference um, in the work that you're doing to build your pipeline? And I know you started to touch on those already a little bit. Um, well, part of it was just the incentives for us, and I think we were early on in that um, there really wasn't a, a, a guidebook for, for how to do this, but, um, but really making that a priority was, was the first, uh, first thing for us, and those incentives being in place are also important as well. However, you know, none of these are, are codified in, in what we do uh, with the Indiana Department of Education or, or Workforce Development, and that there's not a, additional support for, for these particular things. So uh, we do have a lot of concerns about how we're going to be able to, to sustain that. Um, uh, we're doing basically everything that we can do in, in that the list of 11 uh, ways to, uh, to accomplish this. Um, uh, we are looking for additional support uh, in the form of policies that come down from the Department of Education. Uh, you know, part of our concerns even is that, uh, you know, having uh, teachers with master's degrees, I could hire uh, somebody with a master's degree who, who does not have a, a teacher's license. And, and sometimes that's a, that's a barrier just to get that teacher's license uh, for a, a, a master's degree level um, teacher who hasn't had K-12 experience. So um, some support with respect to that policy, I think would be important. Um, and, you know, I also feel that uh, from a workforce development standpoint, um, we provide a lot of funding in the form of CTE for, for students that, um, that participate in, in K-12, but often that, fun, that funding is not tied to dual credit results either. So um, for, for us, I think it would be important to, to recognize that, uh, that dual credit is a higher level of, of education and should be funded differently from the state. Great, thank you, Josh. And then um, Lakeisha, similarly for you, um, particularly as, as you know, many of our attendees today are K-12 partners, um, including some administrators and um, high school principals as well as superintendents. Um, but I did see a number of counselors and teachers enroll as well. So um, welcome, great to have you. Um, but Lakeisha, as you are, um, um, what, what recommendations or effective practices do you think are most important for our K-12 partners to be thinking of um, as it relates to their partnership with higher ed um, in building that pipeline of dual credit teachers? I think a lot of um, our partners, first and foremost, I think information and communication is key in this endeavor. Um, I think a lot of teachers did not realize that, you know, while they're teaching 
um, I'll, I'll just use a guidance counselor, for example, since you said that while they have a master's degree in counseling, they may not realize that they too can also teach dual credit. They just need 18 hours in a specific graduate coursework. So all you have to do is hold a master's degree and in a specific discipline, or if you don't have a master's degree in a specific discipline, as long as you have a master's degree and you have additional 18 graduate hours in that content area. So say I'm a counselor, I have a master's degree in counseling, but I want my teacher, my school needs me um, partic particularly to English. I can go through the, you know, um, teach Indiana program and gain additional, you know, 12 hours um, because I think six are, you know, pedagogy that you get for just having the master's degree, but you get additional 12 credit hours in English, you know, content. So now I can be credentialed to teach English at the high school level as well for dual credit. So I think that just having the information and knowledge is going to be key. Um, a lot of our school partners, and I noticed that uh, Hobart is on here, shout out to Hobart. <laughs> um, I noticed that um, a lot of them are getting ahead and I noticed Tim dropped a comment in, in the chat about being proactive and getting ahead. So kudos to you know everyone who realizes that 23 is, very, is looming and it's around the corner. Um, and so involving your higher ed partner in the hiring process is preliminary, whether it's redacting a resume, a candidate for hires resume and credentials and you know, or transcripts and sending them over to us unofficially um, our program chairs are happy to review the credentials, you know, in advance so that, you know, you can know who you are having, you know, come into your building to teach now and maybe also getting them kind of pre-vetted because far too often is it that a school's, you know, interest or desire in certain, you know, disciplines to teach um, it far exceeds their ability to vet these candidates. So I think it, involving us in that preliminary hiring process is also key and it does you know work we get a lot of our CTE partners and high schools that do that now that have been doing that for some time um, there's a lot of uh, coming through the pipeline especially with Ivy Tech we have uh, shared partnership agreements so maybe there's a school district that has a fully credentialed math teacher and maybe your school is in that district but you're losing your math teacher as a result of the alternative credentialing process we are, you know, being very creative in this endeavor and allowing that school to have an MOU with another shared school in the area for that math teacher to potentially teach that course virtually or online. And so now that's also another creative way to allow for a school not to miss out on this opportunity. Um, and then another point um, is, is another practice I'm noticing, you know, is we have this thing coming through the pipeline also called Ivy Flex with Ivy Tech that will um, potentially allow a, an alternative credential teacher to get some additional time past the deadline. They will be partnered with an Ivy Tech uh, faculty member for an additional few years. And um, that way now they kind of have a co-teaching option because the, the faculty member from our campus is actually mentoring, if you will, the high school teacher until they actually complete their, their time while they're finishing up their credentials, but they would have to be actively enrolled in a graduate program still. And those are just a couple of the things we notice. We're still working you know, through all of this, but those are just some temporary options that we have in place and recommendations to you know, kind of get ahead of teachers and schools losing out on this opportunity. Uh, well, th thank you um, both so much for your um, just helping us understand what's been a, what has been and continues to be effective um, at the ground level um, for, for both of you and your partners. One of the key things kind of building off of some of the comments you made, Lakeisha, one of the key things that really emerged from the research is that importance of um, the partnership between K-12 and higher ed that um, and to some of the scenarios that you shared, Lakeisha, sometimes it can be very situational teacher by teacher and really it's going it's a matter of going through the resume and going through even transcripts and so um so we would encourage um schools um particularly that are on the call that um to really try to just build that relationship with your higher ed partner um in every way possible that can really help it can help recruit and identify but it can also help really streamline the parts of the process that feel cumbersome or sticky or overwhelming for some of your teachers um, who are considering teaching dual credit or are already teaching dual credit. So, um, so that's one of the reason, one of the many reasons we wanted to have both Josh and Lakeisha be part of the conversation today is not only because of the 
critical perspectives they offer, but because it really is a demonstration of the importance of kind of that, that um, dual partnership between K-12 and higher ed. So I'm doing a quick time check. Um, uh, Lakeisha and Josh, um, one of the, as you know, one of the areas of the report um, touches just briefly on the importance of diversifying the field of um, dual credit teachers in Indiana. And um, while there is not um, new data on that, um, except for it being identified as a recommendation and some considerations for moving forward, um, we did want to ask just what your perspective is on that. And so as we wrap up, this might need to be a, a quick response, um, but if you could each share just your perspective on the importance of diversifying the field of dual credit teachers, not just in terms of race and ethnicity, but that is one of the elements of representation we're concerned about. Um, so I'll, I'll hand it off to either of you. I'll start. Um, I think like I, I just mentioned, um, having the knowledge in, in before us, I, I know when I learned about STEM teach and, um, in, I'm sorry, Indiana teach and um, the STEM is it STEM teach program? Mm -hmm. I learned about it from sitting um, in conversations like this, but it was not like just provided to me. And then I took that information and shared it out internally with like our program chair, specifically my education department chair, who is who also is a woman of color and did not know. And as soon as she learned about it, she was very interested in participating in it to, you know, particularly be able to help out in our school districts, because we know that we're losing, you know, a lot of teachers um, due to the the alternative credentialing status, and so she was she was very excited to learn about it. I was excited to learn that we can go back and also get you know graduate credit hours in a content area um, by holding a master's degree already, just to kind of be that additional pillar. And then as an education instructor, you know, teaching uh, individuals to become educators and teachers, she was she was really flabbergasted that she didn't have this information sooner because she could be sharing this out with her students in classes, you know, that are going for educational degrees. So I think inform information is going to be key. I don't know, if, you know, if there's another way it needs to be advertised, not just through education partners, maybe, you know, through some career partners as well, because I, I think people will bite if they have the information before them. Um, and, and because that, to me that that allows for access so I'll, I'll start there and kind of piggyback off of what josh has to add yeah i, I agree that the diversification is is extremely important and, and you mentioned about race and race and ethnicity as, as being priorities in that as well and and you know i also feel that that it, it's important that um that we attract those with advanced degrees that are in the private sector um, into education as well. I, you know, firmly believe that um, the more we get our students out of our schools and, and experiencing um, the, the quote unquote real world, and the more that we can, can pull in professionals with advanced degrees to be in our schools and working with our students, the, the better quality product that, that we're going to produce. Um, so that, um, that diversification is important on, on so many different levels. Um, and and uh, hopefully, you know, we can develop some concrete um, strategies to to address that. And you know, speaking from a small, those of you who know uh, Wabash, a very small um, community, uh, very homogenous population. Um, you know, our, our goal really is diversification as a community as well. And and hopefully, this is one of the ways that we can do that is to to attract talented uh, people from different uh, races and different ethnicities to come teach here in our in our building. And not just from the, the race standpoint, like you said, it, diversity it comes in a, a, a myriad of areas. Um, but like I mentioned earlier, the guidance counselor with the, the master's degree in counseling who did not know that they can acquire an additional 18 hours in math or English and become now the dual credit math teacher for that particular school or another school. So I think, you know, just reaching out, you know, being resourceful internally and saying, okay, you have a master's degree. How, what are you, are you interested, you know, in staying in, in your particular role, you know, or would you like to add additional pay? Maybe, you know, have a part, be a part-time teacher and, and just create more of like an adjunct pool inside your own high school campus. Wonderful. Well, um, well, we we are at our time, but we just couldn't help but conclude our conversation without touching on that because we know that um, 
from in particularly from the research from the Commission for Higher Education that dual credit and um, has just a transformative impact on students throughout the state and we just want um, as many Indiana students as possible to really see that a dual credit classroom is a space for them and we um, and we know that it's a great um, and key lever for closing equity gaps as well among our populations of students that are experiencing equity gaps so with that um, we will conclude our conversation it almost feels like part one <laughs> of the conversation and actually for the um the survey that you all will be completed i believe it's in the chat um so please take a few moments to complete the survey about today's um, presentation we are very data driven here at cell and um and take your feedback um to heart um so that we can continually improve and deliver the best support and training to you as possible um on that survey though we do have a question about whether or not you would be interested in a follow-up really like a, a planning workshop um that's more more hands-on um, and more kind of roll your sleeves up and start really talking about building your own pipeline of um, dual credit teachers. So on the survey, please indicate for us if you'd be interested in, um, in a second follow-up workshop. Um, there's a few other slides that um, just list resources on them that you will receive um, as you receive um, um, information from today's presentation. So I'll share one. Um, and I won't go through these in detail, but I know Lakeisha, we didn't have a chance to talk about them, but they're just critical resources being offered by Ivy Tech this summer for all of our schools to know about um, both crossing the finish line and um, also free courses for high schoolers. This language is taken directly from the Ivy Tech website, um, but the title here is linked. And so when you get the slides, please do go to the Ivy Tech website to find out more about crossing the finish line and um, the free courses being offered for high schoolers. Um, and then we've also linked um, a few key resources that we've talked about today from CEL, um, STEM Teach Indiana, Teach Dual Credit Indiana, and then um, being able to access and download the full report. And I think all of these have been linked in the chat as well, but just so you have it in one place. Um, thank you all once again for making the time to be here today, um, but more importantly, Thank you for your um, time and commitment and priority on expanding um, dual credit um, throughout Indiana. And, um, and also Josh and Lakeisha and Carrie, um, thank you for being part of the conversation today. And um, we hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.